Hello and welcome to today's lesson which is looking at an introduction to electricity which is formed part of an A-level bridging course. So this is a lesson for people who want to understand the concepts of electricity and see what the topic of Unit 4 on AQA A-level physics is about. So we can start to understand electricity by considering a metal wire. So let's consider a wire such as copper. Now, metal wires are full of free electrons. Now, free electrons are examples of mobile charge carriers in electrical circuits. Now, a free electron is an electron which is not bound by, by any nucleus or ion, so it's freely moving within the metal. Now, the greater the amount of mobile charge carriers, the better the electrical conductor or that the metal wire will become. Now this makes the uh, free electron a mobile charge carrier as they have a charge and they can move throughout the material. Now due to metallic bonding, the outer shell electrons in the metal will become metallic will become mobile charge carriers. Now it's better to refer to electrons as mobile charge carriers as this allows other charged particles to produce a current, such as um, a sodium ion, for example. Now, electrons can be mobile charge carriers because they have a negative charge. Now, as you've learned previously, electrons are very small particles and have a negative charge. They are what we call a lepton, which means they are fundamental. They can't be broken down any further. Now, if a material does not have many mobile charge carriers, it cannot conduct electricity. It is what we call an insulator. Now, a charge is a fundamental property of a material like colour is. Now you can't visualise charge but only observe the behaviour it causes. Now we can use the charge of an electron to force them to move in the same direction in a material. Now electrical energy is the kinetic energy of mobile charge carriers moving in a particular direction. Now electricity in metal wires occurs when the mobile charge carriers in the metallic structure are all moving in the same direction. So if you have no ele electricity in your particular the wire, okay, the electrons are moving around randomly, which we call electron drift, but when there's an electrical energy in a wire, all of the free electrons, all of the mobile charge carriers are moving in the same direction. Now, as we mentioned before, electrical charge is a property of a particle which determines whether it moves in the current or not. For example, an electron has a negative charge, so because the idea that negative charged particles uh, repel other negatively charged particles but are attracted to positively charged particles, this allows objects to move due to their charge, so as a result, it can allow a current to be produced. Now, all charged particles move in a current if there's potential difference placed across them in an electrical circuit. So as the electrons have a negative charge, it means that the electrons can move in a current. So your free electrons are examples of mobile charge carriers. Other examples of mobile charge carriers can be free protons, can be positive metal ions. Anything which is freely moving and has a charge can be a mobile charge carrier. So the reason why we tend to focus though on electrons is that the force needed to make things such as free protons and positive metal ions move tends to be very large so it's difficult to achieve at room temperature because these particles are much larger than your, than your very very small electrons. Now. The standard unit of charge is called the coulomb, where one coulomb of charge is one amp second. So it's basically one coulomb is the charge passing at a given point in a wire when a current of one amp flows through the wire for one second. Now one coulomb of charge has been found to be the amount of charge accumulatively on 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons. So we can then work out what the charge on one electron is because we do 1 over 6.25 times 10 to the 18 coulombs. So it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and it's obviously a negative value because we say electrons are negatively charged. Now you are expected to memorize that value for A-level physics. Now, the next thing we've got to consider is something called voltage. Now, there are two types of voltage in electrical circuits. There is the electromotive force, or EMF, and there is the potential difference, PD. Now, a voltage in general is the work done per unit charge okay, in a circuit. Now, the electromotive force is the work done into the circuit per unit charge, or the energy supplied by the power source 
per unit charge. However, not all of the energy supplied to it is then used by the output as some energy is wasted as heat and light, and then the energy transferred from the charge to the output of the circuit is called the potential difference. So the potential difference is the work done out of the circuit per unit charge. So we can actually write the equation as this, that the electromotive force, which is the input energy per unit charge, equals the potential difference, which is the useful output energy per unit charge, plus the energy per charge dissipated due to resistance, which we can sometimes refer to as the lost volts of the circuit. Now, any source of electrical energy is an EMF source. So a battery, a cell, a power pack is a source of EMF. Now, any, so, and now any electrical output is what we call a potential difference transducer. So a filament bulb, a buzzer, an LED, they are all examples of things which use a potential difference in a circuit. So the common name for these circuit outputs is called a transducer. So we can show the differences between the voltages with the following diagram. So in this particular example, the cell is providing EMF into the circuit, whilst these two bulbs are using a potential difference out of the circuit. Now if there was no waste, if there was no resistance in the electrical wiring, we could then say that the EMF in would equal the PD out. But there is waste energy dissipated as the electrons or the mobile charge carriers travel through the wires of your circuit. So it's actually more fundamentally correct to say the EMF in equals the potential difference out plus the waste energy dissipated to the surroundings. Or what we can sometimes call it as the lost volts of the circuit. Now, this concept, which produces waste energy in electrical circuits, is actually called the internal resistance of the circuit. Now, just to link back into how this works with your mobile charge carriers, is that in most, in most situations, the mobile charge carriers in a wire are free electrons. Now, like we mentioned before, electrons are negatively charged, so wish to move to the positive charge and move away from their same charge, the negative charge. So if an EMF is provided by a battery or a power pack into the circuit, on one side of the circuit you have a positive charge, on the other side of the circuit we have a negative charge. So the electromotive force will cause the electrons to be attracted to this positive charge, to be repelled by this negative charge and move towards the positive, which will allow these all these mobile charge carriers, these free electrons, to move in the same direction. Now when that this occurs, this will produce an electrical current. So for an electrical current to flow through a closed circuit, the circuit must include a source of electromotive force. So an electromotive force causes a current to flow when there is a complete circuit. So the electromotive force is the ability for mobile charge carriers to do work in the electrical circuit, but only because they've got a charge. So it's the amount of work done per unit charge inputted into the circuit. And the potential difference is the ability for the charge carriers to do work in the circuit, which can only occur because they've got a charge. So the potential difference is the amount of work done out of the circuit per unit charge. Now the potential difference and the electromotive force allow a current to flow in a conductor. Now current is a measure of how much charge is moving every second. So when an electromotive force is applied across a conductor, a current is produced, which causes a net movement of mobile charge carriers in one direction. So the current is the mo movement or flow of mobile charge carriers through a conductor. The more mobile charge carriers that flow, the larger the current. The quicker the mobile charge carriers flow, the larger the current, and current is measured in amps or amperes. Now we can summarize these concepts with the following picture. So the current measures how much the unit charge moves through a material. The electromotive force measures the energy needed to move the unit charge in the material, whilst the resistance measures the difficulty the charge have in flowing in the material. So the higher the resistance, the lower the current, as the charge finds it more difficult to move. The higher the resistance, the higher the potential difference, as more energy is needed to move the charge through the materials. So let's just recap what we've learned so far. Current is the rate of flow of charge in the material. Current is measured in amperes. So we can work this out with an equation. 
current equals charge divided by time, or I equals delta Q over delta T. Now, charge is the property of a particle that will allow it to experience a non-contact electrostatic force and move in a current. Charge is measured in coulombs, so charge equals current times by time, where the simple equation of this is delta Q equals I times by delta T. Now, the electromotive force is the work done per unit charge to make the mobile charge carriers move in a current, and it's measured in volts. An electromotive force is the work done divided by the charge. So if the EMF is equal to the work done over the charge, or delta W over delta Q. Now, the potential difference is the work done per unit charge to transfer the energy out of the circuit. When the mobile charge carries a movement in a current, it like EMF is measured in volts and it's equal to work done over charge. So like EMF, it is delta W over delta Q. The electromotive force is the work done per unit charge into the circuit. The potential difference is the work done per unit charge out of the circuit. If there was no internal resistance, then the potential difference in the EMF would be the same value. Now, let's go back and recap on this. So let's think of a metal wire like copper before but we'll look at nichrome now so like we said before we've got our mobile charge carriers in there we provide emf which will allow those mobile charge carriers to move in a current which we've mentioned before so we know this idea of of the emf providing the work done to allow those mobile charge carriers to move but as those mobile charge carriers move through the wire they will collide with the metal ions of the wire and they will slow down this lowers the current this is electrical resistance, so it's caused by the metal ions in the wire itself. So the ion charge carrier collisions slows the rate of mobile charge carrier movement, providing a resistance. So we can see it in such like this. Now, the more blocking of mobile, mobile charge carriers, the more the resistance. So there's actually many, many ways to alter the amount of collisions between the mobile charge carriers and the metal ions and change the resistance. So the first person who noticed this concept of resistance was a scientist called George Ohm, who began his research with the electrochemical cell, the battery invented by Alessandro Volta. So as a school teacher in his spare time, he began research with the new uh, battery invented by Volta, and his book was the first mathematical application of electrical circuits, and his work greatly influenced others, even though at the time it wasn't well received. He was the first physicist to consider electricity to occur due to particles, and that links into something called Kirchhoff's laws, which he looked at in GCSE physics, how current and potential difference behave in series and parallel circuits. But but Ohm realised that when mobile charge carriers move to create a current, they have to push their way past lots of vibrating metal ions which make up the material. These charge carriers collide with the ions, causing the charge carriers to slow down. So we, this was discovered by Ohm in 1827. So as a result, we named the new resistance after him, the Ohm. Now Ohm realised that the current and potential difference were directly proportional for certain materials, and this constant of proportionality is resistance. So we call this Ohm's law, but there are only certain conditions where Ohm's law is obeyed. So these factors affect the amount of resistance in an electrical circuit, the type of material, the different materials, the different density of ions, the different the number of collisions, the length of the material, the longer the wire, the more the mobile charge carriers will collide with the metal ions because they've got to travel through more of them. The cross-sectional area of the material. The greater the area, the more spread out the charge carriers are, so the fewer the collisions there are. Now please note, the greater the area of the material, there is not gaps in the material because it's the material. So we can't have more gaps, there'd just be more metal ions there. And finally, the temperature of the material. If the ions vibrate with a greater amplitude, the mobile charge carriers are more likely to collide with them. So there are four factors that affect the resistance in an electrical circuit. The type of material, the length of material, the cross-sectional area of the material, and the temperature of the material. Now we can link these together and we call these the physical conditions of the conductor. So actually the resistance of a conductor depends on the physical conditions of the conductor, the length of the conductor, the 
cross-sectional area of the conductor, the temperature of the conductor, and the material of the conductor. Now, we can, these quantities can change the resistance in an object. So these are the physical conditions which are due to the conductor and nothing else. So we, we, we link this into Ohm's law and define this concept of electrical resistance. So the resistance can be calculated with the following equation. Resistance in ohms is equal to potential difference across the component divided by current through the component, which you used in GCSE physics. Now we can also describe it in the other way around, because we can also express in how difficult it is to have a current flow in a conductor with conductance, how quickly the, the charge will flow through the material. So conductance is the other way around. It's current through the component divided by potential difference across the component, and it's given in units of ohms to the minus one. So it's a new concept. We haven't looked at it at GCSE. Now an electrical co conductor has a high conductance and an electrical insulator has a low conductance and the semiconductor can change its conductance. So you've got your two equations, conductance and resistance, which are inverse of each other. Now either quantity can be used to express the ease of which current can flow through a material. Now these equations and Ohm's law will only work if the physical conditions, temperature, length, material, cross-sectional area are kept constant throughout your investigation. That's because the physical conditions will change the resistance and conductance of a material. So how can we calculate resistance and conductance? Well, you place an ammeter in series with the object, which is used to measure the current through the object, because in the series circuit, there's the same current passing through the resistor and the ammeter, the object and the ammeter. Now, you need to know that an ammeter has no internal resistance because it's needed It's needed so it doesn't affect its own result because if it had a resistance it would slow down those mobile charge carriers moving through the material and affect its own result. Step 2. You use a voltmeter to measure the potential difference across the object. The voltmeter must be in parallel with the object to have the same potential difference. Now no current should pass through the voltmeter or ammeter or the ammeter will not record the current through the object. So to make sure that it takes place, in theory, the voltmeter has an infinite resistance, but in actuality, the voltmeter has an extremely high resistance, and you place your voltmeter in parallel with the device you want to measure. So remember that the voltmeter always has an infinite internal resistance. Then step three, use a variable resistor, either a rheostat, like shown in this example, or a potentiometer, to adjust the current and potential difference as necessary, investigate the variation of current with potential difference, the variable resistor is just in steps, each step, the current and the potential difference are recorded from the voltmeter and ammeter, you plot the measurements on a graph. Now you always need a rheostat or potentiometer in the circuit to gain different values of current and potential difference. So those are the three steps as to how we can measure the resistance of a component. And then the measurements can give the following graph. Now remember, y equals mx plus c, so we've a potential difference on the y, current on the x, the gradient is the resistance. Now we can only really use this if the line of best fit is a straight line, because if the line of best fit is a straight line through the origin, the material is said to obey Ohm's law. It's an ohmic conductor. Now remember, the graphical representation of direct proportion is a straight line through the origin. So what that tells us is that if it's a straight line through the origin, the factors are in direct proportion to each other. So what do we know? We know that current and potential difference are in direct proportion. Now there are many electrical components which don't have this particular rule, that don't follow Ohm's law. That means that the current and the potential difference are not directly proportional. Now, non-ohmic conductors can include filament bulbs, they can include diodes, they can include light-dependent resistors, they can include thermistors. Now, there are different graphs from which you can plot. Now you can plot a current potential difference graph or a potential difference current graph. Now if you have a current potential difference graph, the gradient is the conductance. If you've got a potential difference current graph, the gradient is the resistance. So that's what we've covered previously at GCSE and looking at Ohm's law. Now non-ohmic conductors are conductors where Ohm's law doesn't apply to the component. Current and potential difference are not by directly proportional to each other. The line on the IV graph is non-linear. So we've got filament lamps, semiconductor diodes, and LDRs. Now this is a filament bulb graph 
for the current and potential difference where the gradient is the conductance, so why doesn't it follow Ohm's law? Well, as the potential difference is increased, the temperature of the filament increases. This increases the amplitude of vibration of the metal ions and increases the resistance in the circuit. So there are greater collisions between the metal ions and charge carriers, so the conductance decreases with increased potential difference. What about the diode? Why does the diode have an IV graph like the following? Well, the diode acts like a one-way valve for electrical current. Its resistance is very small, the charge carrier motion in one direction, and very large for charge carrier carry motion in the opposite direction, the negative uh, value on the graph. So it gives you zero conductance in the negative direction and a high conductance in the positive direction. Why does the LDR not follow Ohm's law? Well, the LDR, the light-dependent resistance, works as when light intensity increases and more work is placed into the circuit, the structure of the LDR releases more charge carriers out of its structure, so it increases the number of mobile charge carriers in the circuit, which increases your current flow, increases your conductance, and lowers your resistance, which gets the graphs lines are shown. So, if we go back to this idea of nichrome, which is an alloy of nickel, chromium, and iron, and iron, we know the following. We've got our mobile charge carriers, our delocalized electrons. We can place an EMF source across this particular wire. We can get those mobile charge carriers to all move in the same direction to produce your current. See, EMF is producing your current to flow, as such like that. They'll collide and they'll slow down with your resistance, which we've mentioned before. We look at our different factors which can affect your resistance, our physical conditions. Now, so these quantities can change the resistance in an object. Okay, that's very, very important. So we can actually combine three of these quantities together to one overall factor, which we can call the resistivity. Now, resistivity does not alter for material when it changes dimensions. So it doesn't matter what dimensions your material have, it will always have the same value of resistivity. So resistivity is a constant value for a material, but temperature is not included in the equation, as there's a complex relationship between temperature and charge impedance in a material. So we define resistivity of a material as the resistance of one meter length with a one meter squared cross-sectional area, and we measure it in ohm meters. Now, resistivity is a much more useful quantity than resistance, as resistivity is the same for material regardless of its dimensions, but resistance can be varied depending on the length, the cross-sectional area of the material. So resistivity will never vary on the context of the material. Okay, so resistivity can be used to identify unknown materials as it's the same for material in every situation. However, the equation does not incorporate temperature, so temperature can affect resistance and resistivity. So you tend to quote resistivity at a certain temperature, and the most common temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, room temperature. Now, resistivity acts as a quantitative measure, a number measure of measurement of impedance, and we calculate with the following equation. Resistivity is equal to resistance times by cross-sectional area over the length, or rho equals Ra over L. Now, you might have seen rho as the symbol for density, but it's also the symbol for resistivity. Now, resistivity tends to be quoted for a particular temperature because the resistivity of a material varies with the temperature. Now, this equation is given to you in your examination equation book. It's a very common examination question to ask you to rearrange this equation to find a value. And it's assumed that most materials like are in electrical wires have these circular cross-section areas. So you can use the equation area equals pi r squared to work out your area if you're given the radius of your wire. Or pi d squared over 4 if you're given the diameter and not the radius. Now the resistivity is very important as it gives a quantitative measure of how much resistance the material generates. The higher the resistivity, the, lower the, the less suitable the material is to carry a current in in it. So the values of resistivity are useful in the real world as it can allow physicists and engineers to work out the resistance a material will generate in the application they will use. So the higher the value of resistivity, the better the insulator the material is. So you tend to find that insulators have resistivities from about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 20 ohm meters, semiconductors 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 8 ohm meters, and then 
uh, conductors like metals 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. So here are some common examples. So metals like silver and copper are 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters at 20 degrees Celsius. You've got your semiconductors like silicon at 10 to the 3 ohm meters at 20 degrees Celsius, while you've got your insulators like glass or polythene at 10 to the 11. 10 to the 12 ohm meters at 20 degrees Celsius. So you can see it like that. Now in the conductor, when the temperature is increased, the ions are vibrating at a greater amplitude and collide with more mobile charge carriers, so it increases the resistivity. So the temperature of the material alters the resistivity, and it follows the same physics as how resistance changes with the temperature. However, for a semiconductor, as the temperature increases, the resistivity decreases, why is that? Well, for an LDR, for a thermistor, as you increase the temperature, more energy is put into the circuit. So what that means is more mobile charge carriers are released from the thermistor. So there's more mobile charge carriers in the circuit, lowering your resistivity. So there are three types of material you need to consider how temperature affects resistivity. Conductors, semiconductors, and insulators. So... What have you looked at before? So in a conductor, when temperature increases, the metal ions vibrate with a greater amplitude. So there are more mobile charge carriers, uh, collisions between mobile charge carriers and the ions, so it increases the resistivity. For your semiconductors, what have we mentioned before? So with a conductor, whilst it's a material with lots of mobile charge carriers in its atomic structure, so a conductor has lots and lots of mobile charge carriers, enough to form a current when a potential difference is placed across it. An insulator has very few mobile charge carriers. It doesn't have enough mobile charge carriers to form a current when a potential difference is placed across it. Okay, So as a result, conductivity and resistivity of an insulator are unaffected by temperature. Now, for a semiconductor, there's a reasonable amount of mobile charge carriers in the structure, but they can change how many mobile charge carriers it has in its structure, depending on the work being carried out by it. So like we mentioned before, with your thermistor, when you add work into your thermistor, you increase the temperature. Well, what happens is the thermistor will release mobile charge carriers from the structure, so the electrons will leave the thermistor, they will join into the circuit, so there's more mobile charge carriers in the circuit, so there is going to be less resistivity, so as a result, the resistance goes down. So the other charge carriers join the other charge carriers in the metal wire. So basically, increasing the current decreasing the resistivity. So the higher the temperature, the more work done, the more mobile charge carriers in the circuit. So you can see it like so. So it's an application what we call thermionic emission. Now you might say, if there's more mobile charge carriers in the circuit, won't there be more collisions? So won't the resistivity go up? Well, this effect is extremely small compared to the fact that there's just lots more mobile charge carriers going through it. Because you've got to realize that actually collisions between mobile charge carriers and ions are very rare, because both are extremely small, so are very unlikely to collide with each other. So it means the overall effect of adding more mobile charge carriers from the atomic structure decreases resistivity and increases conductivity. So we can use the phrase, it releases charge carriers from the lattice to become mobile. And it's the same idea for LDRs, except the work is not provided by thermal energy, rather it's provided by radiant energy, electromagnetic radiation, light. So we can look at it here. So for our thermistor, we know that there's a low temperature, little work done to the semiconductor, few mobile charge carriers, high resistance, but at a high temperature, lots of work done to the semiconductor, many mobile charge carriers, low resistance, so we call that a negative temperature coefficient thermistor, which are the only thermistors we cover in A2A A-level physics. So for an LDR, low light intensity, little work done to the semiconductor, few mobile charge carriers, high resistance, but a high light intensity, lots of work done to the semiconductor, many mobile charge carriers, low resistance. So you can see the contrast between the two. So in a semiconductor, when temperature increases, more mobile charge carriers become liberated when work is done on them. So there are more mobile charge carriers in the circuit. This gives more mobile charge carriers in total, decreasing your resistivity. Now, previously, we've looked at conductors, insulators, and semiconductors. But there's also a category of material called a superconductor. But what are superconductors? What are the uses of superconductors? 
what's the physics behind superconductors? Now, as we mentioned before, when a material is cooled down, the amplitude vibration of the positive ions are reduced, the conduction electrons lose less energy colliding, as there's less movement from the ions, so less collisions, so it reduces the resistivity of the material. So many scientists wondered what would happen when the material reaches absolute zero. So they wondered what would take place. Now, Lord Kelvin hypothesized that zero Kelvin, the mobile charge carriers, the delocalized free electrons, would stop moving, there'd be no conduction, and you'd achieve a perfect insulator. However, this was not observed. Another effect was observed. The phenomenon of superconductivity was observed. Now, a superconductor is a perfect conductor of electrical current. A closed loop of superconducting wire will continue to carry the same amount of current constantly. A superconductor is a material with no resistivity and no resistance. So a superconductor loses all resistivity uh, below certain temperatures because there's no collisions between the material ions and the mobile charge carriers. So there's no collisions to alter the path of motion. So in theory, um, this would happen to all, um, all conducts, but that's not the case. Because in some materials, some materials cannot prevent collisions from occurring between ions and charge carriers, even at low temperatures, so they don't become superconductors. Now the temperature at which some conductors can transition to be a superconductor is called the critical temperature. And the critical temperature is a different value for each superconductor material. One of the most famous ones being mercury, which is 4.2 Kelvin, okay, which is almost an absolute zero. So actually, this was one of the first superconductors discovered because Hike Ohms discovered how to liquefy helium, which has a boiling point of 4.2 Kelvin in 1908. So basically, this allowed physicists to experiment, so study how materials behave when immersed in liquid helium and see how they behave at very, very low temperatures. So he wanted to observe whether the material products materials were the same at the low temperatures as they were at room temperature. So three years later, Owens discovered that when you cooled mercury by putting inside liquid helium, so it's at a temperature of 4.15 Kelvin, it becomes a superconductor. So he found that at 4.15 Kelvin, that there was a loss of resistivity, but it doesn't occur gradually, it occurs suddenly, so it loses all of its resistivity suddenly, which you call the critical temperature. So the critical temperature is denoted by a sudden drop in the resistance in this graph. So, a superconductor will only exhibit superconductivity when it's below a certain temperature, the critical temperature. So, below this critical temperature, the current going through the wire stays at a constant level because there's no resistance to lower it, so we call it a persistent current. So, the critical temperature is the point on a graph where the resistivity drops massively, and the persistent current occurs below the critical temperature. Now, pure metals, like mercury, will show a sudden drop, but alloys and ceramics, the mixtures, will show a slight curve. Now, just remember, not all materials will act as superconductors. So there's a pronounced difference between superconductors and non-superconductor materials. Now, it's been the aim of physicists to find materials with critical temperature, similar to room temperature. Now, several other metals apart from mercury exhibit superconductor behavior, especially compounds and many alloys. So modern physics is trying to look in ways to find in ceramics and find alloys which have uh, critical temperatures close to room temperature, so we can achieve superconductivity at quite low prices. So the relative breakthrough materials that have a higher critical temperature will lower the cost. So if you can get it to quite a low temperature, you can actually cool it by putting it to liquid nitrogen as opposed to the very expensive liquid helium. Now currently, the record for the highest critical temperature is minus 110 degrees Celsius, which is very, very cold, but a large improvement over previous values. Now in 1987, a Nobel Prize was won for actually developing a superconductor which had quite a, well, a relatively high critical temperature. So here are some superconductors and their critical temperatures. So the closer the room temperature it is, uh, the critical temperature is the easier and cheaper material is to turn into a superconductor. Pure metals have a low critical temperature, but the future of superconductors is in ceramic materials that have much higher critical temperatures as they're much closer to room temperature. Now, superconductors have two main properties which makes them very, very useful in the real world. Okay, number one, a superconductor can maintain a large, constant current with little losses due to resistance. So they're very, very efficient, 
and secondly they can make a very strong magnetic field because any material that has a current going through it can also become a magnet so because you can get a large current easily you can get a large magnetic field easily so some examples of superconductors are in things like MRI scanners so for an MRI scanner they work with large uh, coils of superconducting materials, niobium titanate, which is immersed in liquid helium to keep it cool. So for an MRI scanner to work, a tank containing about a thousand litres is needed and it has to be kept below 4 Kelvin. So the coils in helium are cool below 4 Kelvin, they're sealed and stay at that temperature for about 10 years, which is the lifetime of the MRI scanner. So if the temperature of the helium rose, it would lose the superconductivity and the machine would become useless. You can use superconductors in things like supercomputers because they dissipate little energy due to resistance, so are quite efficient to run. They give also things like electrical power cables. Now that's very useful because in fact there will be very little energy loss in power cables due to resistance. Now what we do currently is we about 7.5% of the UK's electrical energy is wasted as heat in the wires and the transformers. So if transmission cables could be replaced by superconducting cables, A, you wouldn't need transformers in your national grid and you would also save money on energy savings due to, re to electrical resistance. Now actually the world's first commercial superconducting power cables came into use in 2014 in Germany. So actually, it can actually carry current about five times larger than traditional copper cables. Also, you can use them in things like maglev or magnetic levitation trains. So these trains, which are found in Japan, can travel at much higher speeds as there's a lot less friction because the wheels are not touching the rails. They're levitating because you've got two superconductors producing very strong magnetic fields, provide enough magnetic propulsion to allow your rail to hover above the surface. You can also use them in particle accelerators because they'll produce a very, very strong magnetic field which will allow your particles to be deflected and accelerated a great amount. So in the LHC, the, the electrical field is used to accelerate the particles, but the magnetic field of your superconducting wires is used to deflect the particles into the correct path, and that works because the electrical field is parallel to the particles and the magnetic field perpendicular. So our various uses of superconductors in the real world are maglev trains, MRI scanners, particle accelerators, electrical energy generators, fast electrical circuits, and supercomputers. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this lesson looking at an introduction to electricity and what it brings in A-level AQA physics. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.